Well, good morning, Walden Church. I have a little uh, picture puzzle for you. Here's something I want you to look at. Uh, when you look at this picture, I wonder what you see, because there's only one picture, but people see different things. Is that a rabbit or is that a crow? We're going to read Matthew 13 today, and I wonder if the disciples are wondering the same thing about Jesus. How is it that people have such different reactions to him? Some people, including Jesus' own family, thought he'd gone crazy. The religious leaders hated him. They thought he was a monster or the devil or somebody working for the powers of darkness. But the disciples, they saw Jesus completely differently, didn't they? He was the only one they had chosen to follow, and even they couldn't understand it, or at least they weren't able to articulate it maybe just yet. They knew enough that they could leave their old life behind and follow him, but to them, Jesus wasn't crazy and he wasn't a monster. He was their master. And I bet you've even wondered, how come everyone doesn't see this? How come everyone doesn't follow him? It's a question. And it's a question we could ask even this year in 2022, isn't it? You know, last week we said there were 7 million people in Texas who right now are not Christian. How come? I'm sure they've heard about Jesus. I mean, we've all experienced Christmas. We know the story. What do you see that they don't? Why are there so many different reactions to Jesus? You and I also know that the word gospel means good news, and the good news that Jesus came to restore a relationship with us and God. And it's not just good, it's great. In fact, it's the best news in the entire world. And if that's the case, how come everyone doesn't see what we see? How come everyone doesn't react the way we react? Why is it that people still reject the gospel? Isn't Jesus all about love and grace and forgiveness? And doesn't he offer everyone a life with him in eternity? Why would people ever reject that message? Jesus is going to address all of those questions right here in our chapter. We're going to be in Matthew 13 today, and we are continuing our study in the book of Matthew. Verse 1 and verse 2 Say that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables. So the crowds are gathering by the seaside, Jesus climbs into a boat, and he begins to teach them, and the Bible says that he uses story. He doesn't share the secrets of the universe. He doesn't just give the director's commentary to God's master plan. Instead, Jesus starts to tell a little story about a sower who scatters seed. And this was before giant machines planted uh, seeds. Farmers had to actually walk up and down and, and scatter seeds by hand to be planted. It's not like planting tomatoes where you have one seed and you carefully put it beneath the dirt. This is seed where you're grabbing whole handfuls and just throwing it into the wind. And it seems kind of like an odd thing to do for Jesus. You have a large crowd like this. They've all gathered. They want to hear you. They probably have their own questions. This is probably where you should pull out your A material. In a crowd like this, people are going to have all kinds of questions. Chief among them, who is this guy? right? What's this guy all about? Could this guy be the Messiah? Up until now, Jesus hasn't said. And people have heard about his reputation. He's a great teacher, does miracles. So a crowd gathers, and a good move right now on Jesus's part would be to say, I suppose you're all wondering why I called you here today. There are a lot of rumors, and speculations floating uh, around about me, and so I thought, Today, I'm here to tell you that, what? <laughs> what, Jesus? With a crowd like this, this would be a great moment for clarity, for definition, for direction. I mean, we're 13 chapters into the story. Now would be a good time for the author to give us some insight. 
Nope, not Jesus. He is not the Messiah that everyone expected. And as we're going to see, his kingdom is not like everyone expected. So you can be certain that when he sits down to teach, it's not going to be like everyone expects. Jesus gathers a crowd, he sits down in a boat, and he begins to tell them a parable. So that would make us ask, well, what is that? What is a parable? Well, a parable is a practical story, and it's told as comparison, and that comparison teaches us a deeper spiritual truth. And we know this about Jesus. He used illustrations in his teaching all the time. And many people uh, understand also that we call those stories parables. Uh, One theologian said, an understanding of parables is essential if one is to understand the teachings of Jesus, since the parables make up approximately 35% of his recorded sayings. So, verse 34. All these things Jesus said to the crowd in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parable. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So if that's the case, and Jesus spoke 35% in parable, then we should properly understand how to listen and interpret a parable. Because we don't want to get it wrong. I mean, if Jesus is teaching in some sort of code, we certainly want to be able to decipher the code and understand it, don't we? So here's some simple advice for Jesus's uh, more complicated teaching. First, you want to listen from the perspective of the audience. I mean, clearly Jesus is using symbols that are more familiar to the audience of this time. And they don't always directly translate to people in our time. So we need to understand you're going to have to do some extra work. The answer is probably not going to be super obvious and sitting right there on the surface. For instance, you and I, we have never lost a sheep, (laughs) right? So first we have to put ourselves in the place of the audience. We have to give a little bit and understand, you know, where, the time in which they live and, and, and what they would have heard. And from that, we need to define the main point. Define the main point. Jesus' parables, they're not very complicated. You know, we, so, so we should grab on to what he is chiefly trying to say. Jesus' parables were short. They only had a few characters. They had a very simple plot. So it's not like Jesus was teaching multiple points. Each parable was designed to teach a single truth. So, what's that truth? And it should be applicable, right, to anybody who lived in any time period. So we then allow that truth to teach us. We allow that truth to teach us. And since it is Jesus and it is a teaching, even though the setting and the characters are not familiar to us, truth is still truth. Truth is universal. Truth stretches beyond time. So that truth that Jesus is trying to relay should be just as powerful to us as it was to the people who first heard the story. So why does he do this? Why isn't he more forthcoming with his crowd and and, and just giving them straight and direct answers to their questions? Why isn't he telling them what they're looking for and, and just say what he meant? Well, he tells us. We're going to go a little further into the chapter. I mean, we'll go back and we'll read chapter 13, don't worry. I just want to skip ahead to Jesus' reason. The disciples ask him this question. Then the disciples came to him, why do you speak in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom and heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes, they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see 
and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. What we see here in this chapter is Jesus clearly tells us that he has two audiences. He says there's two people, there's two kinds of people that listen to my teaching. There's the crowds, and then there's the disciples. And in his explanation, he gives us a reason that he incorporates those two audiences, okay? He has people who get it, people who are on board, and people who don't. So Jesus speaks in parable. First, to reveal truth to those who believe. There were many people in the crowds who got it, and the disciples got it. And of those people, Jesus says, God has blessed them with the secrets to the kingdom of heaven. Like you, you get it. You've asked, how come everyone doesn't see the things that I see? How come they don't react to Jesus the way I react? Right? You, you ask that about your neighbor. How, how come they don't see what I see? Well, it's because Jesus has two types of people out there in the audience. There are people who get it and people who don't. And these parables reveal truth to the people who believe. But then parables also conceal truth for the people who don't. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the government officials, his own people whose hearts were hardened, they saw all the same miracles, they heard all the same teaching, and they denied it. So God did not allow them to understand the parables. Jesus says very plainly to the disciples, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. In other words, some people get it, some people don't. That's why you'll often see Jesus say, to those who have ears, let them hear. Jesus is going to teach us today about the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 13. This is his topic. Or, or he's talking about the kingdom of God. Sometimes you'll hear it say the kingdom of God. And so we also have to ask, well, what does Jesus mean about that? We have to know before we start this chapter, because it sounds like kingdom of heaven is about heaven, right? The, the afterlife, life after death. Is Jesus talking about heaven? No. His stories are not typically about heaven, or, or like the afterlife. No, instead, he, the kingdom of heaven is the reign of heaven, or the rule of heaven here now on earth. Jesus isn't talking about the afterlife. He's talking about the authority that he has currently. You know, for weeks, we've been talking about Jesus's authority. And up until this chapter, people who've been watching and listening, they've been waiting for clues that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And these parables are now the beginning of the admission that he is the Messiah, that he is sent by heaven to reign and to rule now. And one of the things you'll hear Jesus say is, the kingdom of heaven is here, or the kingdom of heaven is now. The kingdom of God is here, meaning it is now. It's a present reality. Jesus will often say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus, in his parables, is teaching crowds of people about the role the Messiah plays in all of this. Because they're expecting him, if he's the Messiah, to set up an earthly throne and to reign over other kingdoms. They would expect the Messiah to overthrow other worldly governments like Rome. And he would establish that heavenly kingdom on earth. So Jesus is using parables to help them understand the truth. Jesus says, you expect the kingdom to be like this. So I tell you, the kingdom of heaven is actually more like this. And so when you read this in 2022, you have a perspective that the first hearers didn't have. You live between these times. You live in a time between when the king walked the earth and when the king returns again. So now we open up Matthew chapter 13 and we listen. We listen for the main point and the truth that Jesus is teaching. 
Verse 1 says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell among the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let them hear. So, with all of that backstory that we did, right, with all of that homework, we covered and, and we dove in, it, it helps, doesn't it? It helps to have that. And so we then can read the parables with that knowledge, with that perspective. And this first teaching, it's kind of like a commentary on Jesus himself. The sower is the one who spreads and who scatters like Jesus, right? Teaching, teaches from person to person, crowd to crowd. So how come more people don't understand him? Right? This is the question that is on the disciples' heart. How come more people don't believe him? Why don't more people follow him? Jesus answers that question in this first story. And what we see is the problem isn't the sower. The problem isn't the seed. The problem is the ground. And Jesus explains his story in verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, The evil one comes and snatches away that has been sown in his heart. This is what is sown along the path. As for what is sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what has been sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Jesus says the problem is the ground. And he mentions three different types of people. He mentions hard soil. This is the person who hears the word and just rejects it. The message stays right there on the surface. It never sinks down in darkness and the things of this world come along and snatch it. Jesus says there's also superficial soil. These are the people that raise their hands and accept Jesus. Maybe they come to church for a year or two. But then when pressure comes, when things just get busy, they fall away. As soon as life gets difficult, As soon as there's an obstacle, as soon as something else comes along, they fall away. You look around and wonder, wow, where are the Smiths? Their faith had no root. It was easy for the wind to come along and blow them away. Did you ever wonder why Jesus calls this seed? Because seed takes time to grow. Sure, we can get excited when a new person becomes a Christian, but that's just the seed, that's the beginning. It has to take root. In truth, we don't know what will happen to that seed or where that person will be in a few years. The truth is not every seed grows, right? We also see a divided heart. This hearer receives the word and it grows. They nurture it, they see life, they see growth. But over the course of time, they develop other obligations. They have other loves. In 2022, this one example, I think, applies the most to you and to me. I know we want to believe that we're the good soil, but I really feel like we're probably this one. Jesus says, beware of all the other loves. They choke out the word and the kingdom. Jesus says, beware of thorns, right? And when you think about thorns... Thorns don't just appear overnight. Thorns grow up gradually and interweave in our life, and they slowly choke, right? It's a slow process. So slow that you don't 
notice. And more and more, we give our heart away to the stuff of this world. We allow other desires and other responsibilities, other tasks to distract us from what is the most important. And then there is the fruitful heart. Jesus says this person not only hears, but they understand. And because they understand, they bear fruit and they grow. They grow spiritually and others around them grow. So I suppose there's another aspect to the story because Jesus uses the example of a sower scattering seed. And we're going to see this repeat itself with the uh, parable of the fisherman's net a little later. The point is, you make multiple attempts, multiple tries. It's not just a a one shot and you're done. You don't just focus one time with one person. Jesus says you cast a wide net. You throw down a lot of seed in a lot of places. Why? Well, to hedge your bets, right? Right? with all the different types of ground and all the different types of people in the world, we have to be prepared that the kingdom won't always be received well. So we have to scatter seed. Look at the next story in verse 24. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, Then the weeds appeared also, and the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in the field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? He said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So this is the answer to another question that the disciples would be asking. I mean, if this is the Messiah, if he's come to be king, then he's come to wipe out the opposition, right? It's judgment time. The the enemy has placed opposition in our path, uh, whether they're atheists or other religions or pagans. Wouldn't it be better if Jesus came and uprooted all of that. I mean, let's bring judgment right now on counterfeit faith and false religion. Shouldn't we clearly make divisions between bad and good? What does Jesus say? Well, he answers that question in verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and the disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who has sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The son of man will send his angels, and they will gather out his kingdom, all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus says, you want judgment now? Judgment isn't today. It's coming, but it's not today. Remember, the people are confused about who the Messiah was supposed to be and what the Messiah was supposed to do. People expected him to overthrow Rome and to set up an earthly kingdom with the Jews. But even though judgment is postponed, right? It's postponed. Let's not ignore the fact that Jesus says, but it's still coming, right? Judgment is coming. And Jesus says the condemned will be burned with fire. People thrown into a fiery furnace. And I've heard some people say, well, I mean, that's got to be a metaphor. There won't really be actual fire in hell. Okay, perhaps. But you can't ignore the fact that what Jesus is saying is, it'll be bad, (laughs) right? You you won't like it. You won't get there and, and think to yourself, huh, This isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. (laughs) 
Jesus says it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Nobody's going to like it. And then he tells them the parable of the net. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it, ashore it, and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. And so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. And in that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A fisherman's net is slow. It begins to drag the sea and it gathers up everything, fish, plants, garbage, right? And so when it's pulled into the boat, then the fisherman separates what he wants to keep and what he doesn't. Jesus says again, judgment is not now. Judgment is coming. And he says that those who are discarded, once again, he says, are thrown into a fiery furnace where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The town garbage dump was on the outside of town, on the other side of the wall, away from everybody else, right? It was separated. And the trash, the garbage there, was burned weekly. And so that smell and that smoke, it would attract wild animals, wild dogs that would howl at night and they would fight over scraps. And this image of a burning trash pile with wild animals all around it is how Jesus describes those who are hard soil, superficial soil, soil choked out by weeds. This burning trash pile is what awaits those who hear and yet fail to follow. So Jesus tells another story. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in the field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Jesus says his kingdom starts small and it grows. Remember, Jesus is trying to tell them what the kingdom is actually like. It's like a penny. You take it to the bank and it compounds with interest until it's a million dollars. I mean, look at Jesus' own life as metaphor, okay? A baby starts small, born in a manger, born to poor parents, surrounded by barnyard animals, visited by shepherds, grows up amongst blue-collar workers. He then grabs 12 loser disciples and eventually turns the kingdom of God into a worldwide, global movement. How? How is it that people are still talking about Jesus today? He's still on the cover of magazines at the checkout counter. How is it that his influence reaches all the way to 2022? Jesus says that's how his kingdom works. It starts small and it grows, right? The sower plants a seed and it grows. The kingdom of God grows and grows bigger and bigger. It reaches. The church reaches. The church grows until one day you and me, <laughs> we are part of this story now. We are part of this growth. We came from small seeds. And what's the entire, well, I mean, step back and look at the entire chapter as a whole. Okay, what is this entire chapter about? Not individual stories, but what's the, what's the theme of this whole chapter? Growth, right? Growth from the smallest of seeds. The point is growth. The point is more. How does growth happen? Well, growth happens when we encourage growth. We, sh we should we should do that. We should encourage growth, not prevent growth. I tell you, I don't understand 
pastors and teachers who say, well, church isn't about numbers. We, sh we shouldn't get hung up on numbers. That's not true. <laughs> it's all about numbers. We said last week, it's about getting more people from this side of the line to this side of the line. So of course it's about numbers. There's an entire book in the Bible called Numbers, right? Constantly we see the Bible counting disciples, counting fish, counting lepers, counting loaves, counting the thousands of people who came and listened to Jesus speak. Woe to the church that is content with its 30 to 40 people and who never grows. How sad it must be for them to exist without them ever knowing that they are, are a part of a global kingdom. They are a part of a global movement that is ever reaching and ever expanding the gospel message. Jesus says plants that don't grow are burned. What's the point of this chapter? From the insignificant becomes the extravagant. The gospel spreads, it grows. The kingdom spreads, it grows. You hear it and you get it, or you hear it and you don't, right? Why does that happen? How come, why does that happen, Jesus? How come some people get it? Why did the disciples get it? Why did the 12 get it? Jesus has two more stories for you. The parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. Verse 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes out and sells it, and he buys that field. Verse 45, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all he had and bought it. Jesus said, It's not foolish. It's not foolish to give everything up to gain what is the most important. The disciples gave up everything to follow. Remember? Why? We've been talking about Jesus for three weeks. They left it all behind because they understood the value of following Jesus. They could easily summarize their life. They could compare it to before Jesus, and it was a no-brainer, no-brainer. I maybe had health and strength and wealth and life and money and my kids and my spouse and all of my other pursuits, but combined all together, combine all my worldly pursuits together, they do not come close to the pursuance of Jesus. Paul says in Philippians 3, Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul says, if it's all temporary, it's all worthless. Right? If none of this will last, then it is all garbage. The treasure is the kingdom. The treasure is Christ. He is worth it. Following him is worth it. Yes, you might lose some other things, but following him is worth it. A call to the kingdom is a call to value. A call to the kingdom is a call to reward, a call to treasure. Tell me something. If you had to put a cost to it, how much is eternity with Jesus worth? A million dollars? $50 million? Be honest, just for a minute. And we're going to start seeing where our thinking typically goes wrong. If you could buy eternal life, which, which you can't, but if you could, would you give up everything so that you could buy it? The men in verse 44 and 45 gave up everything. They knew the value of the thing they found a treasure worth more than everything they owned. You know, there's a story about Cleopatra and Mark Antony. 
they were at a, a meal together and she said, I bet you that I can eat the entire wealth of a nation in a single meal. And Mark Anthony said, okay, I'll take you up on that bet. Let's see if you can eat the wealth of an entire nation in one meal. According to the story, Cleopatra had two of the most valuable pearls in all the world, and she wore them as earrings. She took one of the earrings, removed the pearl, and dropped it in her wine glass. And the wine's acidity was strong enough that it actually helped dissolve part of the pearl, and she simply just swallowed it drank it. And she won the bet with Mark Antony. In one meal, she had actually eaten the entire wealth of a nation because it was estimated that that single pearl would have been worth $14 million. In the days of Christ, pearls were very valuable, very hard to find. As a matter of fact, in this part of the world, even harder to find. The nearest place they could be found was the Red Sea, but those pearls didn't have a lot of value. They weren't good pearls. The best pearls came from India, and that was very long uh, distance, very far distance away, and dangerous. So if a person found a valuable pearl, it was worth a lot of money, which means when Jesus tells this story, only the richest people in all the world had pearls. And when Cleopatra drinks her pearl, it's a sign of her power and her wealth. It was the same as a rich mogul lighting a $100 bill on fire so that he could light his cigar. Cleopatra was saying, I am so powerful, I have money to burn. Can you imagine? Can you imagine finding a pearl of that value? It would be like you went walking in a field and just saw a gold nugget the size of your fist, it'd be rare. Hebrews 11 says, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ a greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to that reward. Now, we do realize that Moses had never even heard of Jesus, right? And Moses, when he lived in Egypt, was richer than rich. He lived among the Egyptians. He was one of them. He could have had anything. He could have lived any life. And the author of Hebrews says, Moses gave all of that up to follow the God of his people. And we make the comparison again between following Jesus and the kingdom of heaven, between eternal life and security and a nice car. They don't compare, do they? Jesus gives us a glimpse here of our own future, doesn't he? A little lesson to see if you and I are paying attention. He is asking, what has value in your life? We think money has value. We were actually taught that money has value. Granted, it's a tool. We can use that. We can even use it to help people. We can use it to pay our bills. We can even use it to have some fun along the way. But in fact, money is just metal and paper. Right? Value is something that is important to you. Value means that there's this object or this place or this experience that is important to you. And the higher the value, the more important it is. So what is it that you value? Is it treasure? Is it something you've buried in the ground? Is it the perception of security? They say money provides security. I think that's pretty funny. I could have a heart attack and die before I finish this sermon. All the money in the world isn't going to help me. You could be hit by lightning, die from a medical condition before you ever even walk out that door. All the money in the world is not going to save you. Money doesn't really provide security. It's a false sense of security. Real security is found in eternity. 
Real security is found in heaven. Real security is worth more than any amount of money that you could carry. More than great treasure, more than a beautiful pearl, the crowds expected Jesus to overthrow a government. The crowd expected Jesus to bring judgment on their enemies. And Jesus said, it's not time for that yet. What we do now is we plant seeds. We grow this kingdom. We help people live so they can see how valuable and how necessary the kingdom is and how it should be in their lives. And we teach people to live for that kingdom, so much so that they would literally give up everything in order to keep it. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are that treasure. You are that pearl of great price. You are the one thing above all other things. And may it be evidently so in my life. May I live in such a way that honors you and shows the world how much I treasure you, how much I value that relationship. As Paul says, all the rest of the things in this world are garbage. It's trash. Nothing is more important than you. May your church continue to grow all across this world. May every church, no matter how small, continue to grow, to reach, to extend its walls, to build, to find new ways to plant seed and to nurture seed and to help those people come to an understanding that your kingdom is more valuable than anything else in this world. And may that good news inspire each of us to talk to our neighbor and to explain to them the thing that we see that they cannot see. May more people have their eyes opened. May more people have their ears opened. May more people be exposed to the wonderful, beautiful kingdom of God. Amen. Thank you for coming out and enjoying uh, this Sunday morning with us. We are so grateful to see you. And of course, we would love to have you here. We'd love to have you here. We are open every Sunday. We have two services, one at 9.30. It's a traditional service and we have a choir. We sing all your favorite hymns. We have a second service at 11 o'clock. It's a more contemporary service. You can come relax. You can wear jeans if you'd like. Uh, we'd love to have you. We have a contemporary uh, worship band. They sing uh, songs that you love that you hear on the radio. And we have a children's program at that time for all ages, uh, preschool all the way up through high school, and we even have a youth group that currently meets on Wednesdays. Now, our youth group right now has kids uh, even in fourth grade. We have fourth grade through high school coming to youth group, and the best, of, best news is we are right here in your neighborhood. You can just send your kids over on their bike or their skateboard, or they could walk. We're really probably only eight minutes from your house. We will even feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. We love you guys. And if at any time you need to reach out to us or if there's something that you need, please feel free to do so. Just because you don't attend or you're not a member here doesn't mean we don't love you and want to be your neighbor. If there's any way we can be the church where you live, let us know. I'll see you guys next week.